so let's continue on uh, lecture number five. Uh, and in this video, we'll talk about technical writing. Now that we talk about research methodology, we talk about ethics, uh, hopefully you're ready to uh, do literature survey and start to work on your projects, or at least like know, know the basic materials on how to get started, right? Um, let's say you, you conduct your experiment and then you got your results and you want to write a report so they can submit the paper. Uh, in the, the, the content of the lecture today will cover, okay, what do we do, right? So basically that's the today topic. We talk about technical writing. This doesn't include just the paper. Uh, uh, this also includes like everyday writing, but, but everything that is more on the technical side. Uh, what would be the typical structure of a paper and uh, style, which is uh, another really, really important thing. Because at the end of the day, when you start reading more and more paper, when you do literature review, you can see that different area has their own style. Different professor, actually different research group also has their own style. And, and how do you develop your own style so that it is actually um, uh, basically First of all, you want to convey your findings, but at the same time, you also represent you as a researcher, right? Um, one first thing that I have to tell you uh, ahead of time is like, you must dedicate a lot of time, uh, uh, say, just to write your first paper. If you want your first paper to be good, right? You probably would have to spend a lot of time on writing. I can tell you from my own experience, right? My first, my very first paper, um, I did took uh, a month to 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 draft that and submit. But then uh, the iteration of that from that first draft on until it actually becomes the uh, full fledged paper that we publish, I can tell you there's actually like three or four additional months of writing to make sure the texts are as clear as possible and to address every single reviews that we got from the reviewers, right? Because that's, that's basically the goal. The goal is you want to convey your idea. At the same time, you want to make sure your work is as perfect as possible, right? Um, uh, like you want to be able to actually make sure people got what you want to say. Right, so that that's kind of like how much time it is. I actually spent writing my first paper, and and even though it's a lot of time, you also should be proud of it, right? You should own basically. You should own this thing. This your project is, is basically your your child. You want to own whatever you do with the project. You did most of the majority of the work from the scientific point of view. The next step is the writing. You want to also dedicate a lot of time and effort for that as so, well. And today we'll first talk about scientific writing 101, right? So, so the first thing I have to do to um, get started is what's the goal, right? What should be the goal of scientific writing? So the primary goal is to educate your reader, right? You want to make sure your reader, it can be prospective students, it can be PhD students, master's students like yourself, right, that are reading the paper. Uh, it can be professors that are trying to catch up to different new cool idea that, that uh, other groups are working on, right, or researcher, right. So these are your reader. You want to make sure you convey your findings from whatever experiment you're running from whatever hypothesis you're trying to prove, right? You want to make sure you educate your findings and the key knowledge that are related to the topics you're working on, right? Uh, one of the really, really important thing when I read the paper is I would always think, about, okay, what, what did I learn from this paper? What are the important lessons that I never know before when I read the paper? That's the key things I want to extract from reading each paper, right? You also want to convey what's your contribution over the previous works. Because if you cannot identify your contribution, whatever you're doing is useless. Just don't publish that. It's, if there's no contribution, it's useless. You better just throw it away and work on a, 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 some problem that actually provide your, your own contribution over uh, another set of work that people have done already, right? So this is important. What's novel about your work? And it doesn't 
important just on the writing part. It's actually important for uh, your own research and how you want to conduct your research, as I kind of iterate over many, many times in the previous videos, right? And you want to kind of convey what's the key results. And everything here, every single step, you want to make sure you clearly, like clearly state the novelty of your work. What did you contribute over the current knowledge of human? It can be a, a incremental things if you are aiming for uh, something that improves upon the uh, existing system, or it can be something totally new and exciting as well, right? Those are even for sure better, but but these, these one thing that, that readers always want to get is like, what's new? What's the contribution? What did I learn from reading the paper? Then the other really, really important part about this is you want to be at, a, you want to understand your reader, right? Who are your target audience, right? So let's talk about this a little bit because that's quite probably a lot of people. If you think about who is your target audience when you write a paper, so let's let's give it paper or like technical report, right? That will be a big group of people you are likely to forget. So these let's let me first go with like people that you probably will not forget. First of all, it can be like professionals in R and D, researcher professors, right? People who need to keep up with the new technology, the new trend, and actually understand how the world evolved from, from today onward, right? And on top of that, that can be engineer from an engineering team, right? This happened all the time. So if you have a chance to work at, at the, so for example, I, I have worked in a tech company before, been uh, uh, in turn at uh, Intel, uh, AMD, uh, NVIDIA, VMware, right? These company uh, engineer always check out new research because some of these would apply to the problem they're trying to solve. And if it just looks applicable, they're, they're gonna actually try it out, right? And if it works, it will actually get developed into a product. So your writing also have to convey the correct meaning and also have to make sure these group of people can understand your work. The good thing with these two groups is because they have a lot of background. They've been reading papers for ages. They've been reading paper when they took like this uh, like massive program, a PhD program, or uh, if they, they are in the engineering team, right, they know exactly what they want from the paper. They have a really, really good in-depth technical background. So it's easy to convey what you try to do and what you're trying to contribute here. But there are also many other people who might read your paper, graduate students or senior level students, right? So graduate students can include PhD students, most of the time they would have their own area they are working on so they are expert in their area right so it's still easy to convey what you're trying to do because they know actually they know a lot of uh, related work but look at yourself master students you're still new to research still reading papers senior level student from undergraduate school right from your university back in the undergrad uh, 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 school, you would be like, okay, I want to try something for the first time. I still don't have a lot of background. The last thing I learned from textbook uh, are the, the, the canonical assumption, the, the basically the basic background that you can use as the building block. These are perfect building block for actually uh, try to uh, uh, understand the knowledge that you're trying to read from the paper, but they don't have a lot of experience reading a lot of technical papers. You will run into this problem the first time you read the paper, the second time you read the paper, the fifth time you read the papers, the tenth time you read the papers. It will get better and better and better. But you want to make sure you write your, basically you, you want to make sure you write the paper that also cater for this group of people as well, right? Uh, I actually will give you one example. Right? My uh, the research group where I came from uh, is called Safari Research Group. Uh, back in the day when I was in Carnegie Mellon, uh, and also right now, the, my advisor moved to ETH Zurich. Right, one of the things that my advisor always stressed is make sure your writing is clear. 
make sure your writing is clear because a good writing can can basically ensure that whatever you're trying to do, whatever you're trying to convey, whatever contribution you're making are clear, are clear to everyone, not just professionals, but also graduate levels uh, 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 and, and also like maybe senior undergrads as well, including people who might not even use English as a first uh, first language, like myself, right? I, I learned Thai, and then I learned a really, really crappy version of English of whatever whatever the Thai education system teach us, quote unquote English, right? And then we, when I went to the U.S., I actually get used to the actual English language. But I'm not the I'm not a I'm I still it's, it's my second language, right? So the way I perceive these texts is not going to be as um, uh, clear uh, as someone who uses English as their native language. So you want to make sure you understand your readers everywhere in the world as well, right? So these are some of the things you can assume. Many of them would have some prior background, but some of them are going to have almost no background. I'm working in computer architecture, right? But sometimes I would check out papers from other area like database uh, or uh, uh, like database uh, algorithm to make sure I am also keep myself updated and see if there's anything that uh, out there that can apply to, to some of the problems I'm facing, right? So I'm going to have a lot less background in, in those areas, right? You want to cater your writing to both groups, and that's the key message of this slide. You want to make sure you cater them to both groups. So how do we do this? Your idea should be, first of all, novel and interesting. And your writing, also, want, you want to make sure your writing is as easy as to understand as possible, right? So writing for prof professional is, is different compared to, let's say you lead, read like a English novel, right? Those are, how should I put it? Like, I'll say, those are writing for, for the, the uh, like it was like entertainment and, and cultural aspects, right? But these are writing, technical writing is for professionals who are working in the technical area, right? So your first group of readers who demand these things. These are professional like researcher and, and, and professors or, or senior PhD students, right? They'll ask this, why should I care about the things you're solving, right? Is a problem important? If it's not, I don't care. I don't care whatever you're writing is, is not useful to me. It's not useful to the people in the area, so I'm not going to read it. What is it that you have introduced that i never seen before? Things that i never seen before typically would get me excited, right? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to actively learn the new thing that people propose, right? And does the idea really work based on my background? So I've looked at the analysis, I'll look at performance, I'll look at the detail on how these things are done, how certain things are done, how do I uh, model different parts, uh, what are the key assumptions, is assumption realistic, right? So how does your solution would achieve the, the goal? Does it make sense? Does your evaluation make sense? Um, from my experience, right, I, I also re rejected multiple papers that have evaluation that doesn't make sense. If the evaluation, let's say it looks, the number looks good, but those numbers cannot be explained. It can get, the paper can get rejected and people are questioning your results, right? The last bullet point is, that can I replicate your data or your evaluation? How easy it is to, to replicate it? Because the more easy it is to replicate that, the, the easy someone else can actually take your idea in a good way, right? Basically use your idea as a building block for another awesome things that they're gonna do. So this is basically how human evolve, right? From one idea, it builds another idea, and then that, those series of improvements get where we are now and the same thing would apply and we'll go to the future together right so these people in professional world also always want to learn new things all the time so that's the first group the second group is writing for students so this is unique because when you write for students uh you also demand everything in the first group plus right 
any necessary background so that I can understand what I'm trying, what am I reading, right? And any pointers that I need if I want to explore deeper. That's actually one of the primary reasons why you would write the related work section. It would cover things in the area that you, you can say, hey, these are orthogonal work that work on something related. It's not exactly the same problems, but if you hear us, here are what people have done so far. And on top of everything, don't write complicated text unless you really need to. Why is that the case? I'm a reader of technical writing, it's like a piece of technical writing uh, paper, right? I don't care how beautiful the text and the sentence is. I want to make sure I minimize the reader effort decrypting your own text. And I want to maximize the reader's chance to understand your idea. So don't put unnecessary cryptic text. It can actually lower your impact. Just go to the point. Go to the point. And we would now expand on this. Like, what do I mean by minimizing reader's effort? As I mentioned, many of your readers doesn't use English as their own native language. If you look at the population in the world, not like, there's a lot of countries that use a different language. There's China, Japan, Korea, many, many countries in Europe have their own native language, right? They don't use English as the primary language. Their brain, sometimes when you read this, if you never go outside and go, like, like for example, in my case, I went to the US, right? So I can talk in English relatively clear and I don't have to translate into my own language when I speak in English. But uh, for many, many students, in, especially students, right, their brain basically forces them to translate your text into their own language. So you want to make sure your paper is as easy to understand as possible, because when it's easy to understand, your brain would basically dedicate it only a few percent doing that translation and use the rest use the rest to understand your logic, right? The reader brain should focus on your idea itself, not trying to translate the text. This also would minimize misunderstanding that you can make, right? Because the reader are not the English native, basically. The tip says, when you read, whenever you read a well-written paper, make a note of how to write it. Like build your own directory on your computer and store any well-written paper that you came across, right? This allows you to minimize your own effort when you start writing your own paper because you would follow a good example. And this will basically be going to become your writing resources. So here are uh, things that I would say should be right on a good scientific paper. Uh, and these are, by the way, uh, these are my own opinion, right? I do have a lot of experience writing paper. I do have a lot of experience uh, uh, reviewing papers. And, and even though I say it's my own opinion, it's likely to be useful in general, right? So the first thing I'm going to say is be explicit. If you want to tell the reader something, just tell that directly, right? This is one of the most key things, be explicit. Pick either a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach, depending on your situation. But in a general sense, when you're explaining something complex, a top-down approach works pretty well, right? You start from a high level before you go into the detail of each component. You set out the overall goal before you go in there. Okay, to achieve that goal, you're going to try to do X, Y, Z, right? Be simple. Discuss one issue at a time because your brain and a computer, you have one brain. You work more efficiently if you think about only one thing. So you discuss one issue at a time. Use present tense and active voice. These are, this is a part where I say, these are my own opinion. And I believe this to heart actually, because when you use passive voice, people who are not using English as their own main language would have to kind of think about, okay, where's the object? Where's the subject? Where's the verb? If I use present tense and active voice, you minimize the misunderstanding. 
especially if you don't need this this notion of time. Science mean in many many cases signs are fact, right? So you can try to stick with present tense and active voice. This kind of depend on the area. So so I've uh, been actually some some other professor actually call me on this like oh but I my writing is like oh I need to use a, a passive voice. I'm like uh well I mean at least in modern day writing as at least uh, from the top top one of the like not the best or the best like technical outlet for papers that I publish and 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 we are at least in computer science and like computer engineering present tense and active voice is much much simpler and easier to explain your idea and that's what scientists should care about right not some certain formatting that I mean, well, you should follow the, the, the template of the paper template for sure, right? But the sentence structure and, and all those things make it simple, right? Make it simple and people will actually appreciate that. And I still believe it, basically. This is particularly like, make things simple, use simple words. Be methodical. This is actually something that my advisor has been like preaching, actually. So I, I would like to basically spread it forward because I do believe uh, these are so everything here are the key to to uh, a really really good way to write papers be simple and be methodical are main things that my advisor preach all the time and i do believe in that uh if, if you still don't believe in that i can tell you my advisor is like the, 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 he's actually published the the highest actually the number highest number of top tier paper in his field Right. So so be methodical is really, really important. Why? If there are multiple issues, lift them out logically so that the reader's brain can process. They, they, they can process this. There's multiple things that are going on at the same time. It's keep things simple. Keep the same structure throughout the paper. If you use the, the some such certain structure in the in the beginning of the paper, keep that structure. And then list the most important thing first. Human has a pretty short uh, uh, attention span. So the most important thing go there, that go first. And you rank things that you're mentioning based on the importance, right? And, and, and what else, right? You should also never use terminology that are not defined. So you have key terminology, define them before they're used. Don't assume that the same terminology means the same thing for everyone. Students are reading the papers too. The same terminology used in one area might mean something different in another area, right? Again, avoid passive voice. And these are these are my opinions about passive voice. It's useless. It's unnecessarily complex. If papers in your area uh, still use passive voice a lot, I mean, don't feel, feel free to use them. But I can tell you from my own experience, like in computer engineering and, and at least the paper I've read so far, the easier ones are active voice, right? It's much, much easier to understand what the, the writer is trying to say, what the author is trying to say, and that that's the key, right? To understand the science, not English. A very complex sentence. If your sentence start to get long, break them into multiple easy to follow simple sentences. Use present tense if you can stick to that, unless you need to bring in the notion of time, uh, and then nitpick on everything. So, my own is I, I did have a lot of this problem as well, right? I am not a careful person, so I need to try my best to nitpick on everything. But here's if if you. If you are uh, at the state of like writing your own paper, think about every single sentence, paragraph, and section. You start with the sections. Does it make sense? You look at every single sentence, see if it strings together and built a nice paragraph. One good way to actually check your writing is to ask if your like, ask your friend is in the area to read your draft and see if you understand what you're trying to say. Like, that's always, always useful. Um, if they cannot understand, it's likely your fault. If they cannot understand, if they are in the area, they know the background, you write something, it's like, oh, I don't know what you're trying to do here. It's your fault, right? Uh, another thing is you should have a good paper outline. 
you writing basically when you write a paper you are writing a story for your audience right is there a story about uh, uh, an adventure or, or science fiction or whatever right it is actually a story about science and nature and discovery right so you still you are basically storytelling try to make sure the reader understand something from the text right an outline a really really powerful tools to organize your story because i mean every single story would start from this whole high level storyline it allows you to break down all the sections so that you can briefly write what you should go into each paragraph in the section each also each paragraph should logically fall to the next paragraph you also should add the plan on, okay, these are the plots for here uh, in this particular part of the text. These are the figure that explain this paragraph. These are the data you need to support your claim because it's a scientific paper. It allows you to bulletproof your claim. Allows you to actually, like, like in, a, in a more like a literature, like when you write a story for a uh, uh, a science fiction or an, an, an adventure book, right? You want to basically build the world, have an outline of what, what's going on and so that you can actually make everything believable. That's the, one of the key things toward a good story, right? The same things apply here. Uh, what then, then now we have transition to what's the structure of the paper, right? So remember, your goal is to convey the key message. And, and on top of that, there's actually model side goals, right? How can you make sure that people are not bored? <laughs> Human, uh, uh, like, I mean, for some of myself, I have a really short attention span. If I get bored, I'll skip, right? So how, how can you make sure you're not boring the reader? How can you make sure the paper flows really well? You don't like it. It's like when you watch a movie, and if the movie flows well, you lose track of time and you enjoy the movie, right? You want to write a paper like that, where you read from the first line in and then until your last line. Like, hey, this, this is a really, really, really like a good story that I learned, right? Uh, that that would give you the, the additional scientific background that you've never known before. And then how to make your argument bulletproof, right? And there's no specific rules about this because you, depending on what you're trying to do here, right? If you are writing some certain arguments, you can use additional data to back your argument up. If you're uh, 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 claiming something that everyone knows, you can put citations about that claim. Like, hey, every other paper say that as well, right? So here are the typical structure of the paper. We start with abstract. This is basically, if you review the paper you've seen this before, abstract introduction. Then you provide a background, state some assumption you need to state for your paper. Then you motivate the problem. Then you provide your own design. And then now you explain the methodology for your evaluation, followed by the actual evaluation. And then uh, it will pair up with related work and conclusion. Again, you can change the structure as needed. And there's quite often that I will merge background and motivation together because I mean the motivation is in the background. It's, it's how the, the problem is well known to exist. Uh, the, the note here, right, from those section names, one thing that you can do is to actually you can act, uh, use meaningful section names. So, so except for things like abstract intro and conclusion, those are the default name. You can have the other section the way you want to. Use this for your benefit. For example, when you said background, let's just say background. Say background on something. It can be like, for example, I used to work, I mean, I still work on a GPU a lot, right? I can, say, I can say GPU core architecture as a background. People will know, okay, this is going to be about the core architecture of the GPU. Design. Don't just say design. What's the name of your design? Just put in name so we will remember your, your design's name, right? You can also combine sections together and each area has their own style. So you would use basically after your literature survey, follow the style, uh, pick the style that worked really well for you and then see what worked best, right? Follow example from, from well-written papers. 
to write a good abstract, right? Uh, if you have a good example from your review, right, we, we should feel free to discuss them in your review, right? So we can go through that when I'm grading your review, feel free to add them. It's like, hey, the abstract is really clear. Uh, I like it in a certain way. Okay, right? But generally, you want to state the problem, then narrow down the scope of the problem, then state your observation. Okay? We observe X, Y, and Z. And then with the observation would lead to your design. And then talk about, well, just remember to, to just like, hey, say how your design would utilize the observation to solve the problem. So you put everything together and link it back to the problem. And then put in summary of key results that you want to convey. Our technique can get 2x better performance or something like that, right? And then with that, you can go start to write the introduction. This is where the key, the, the, the meat of your paper start to form. Right. And and one thing I would I would stress is introduction is really, really important to make sure people did not get bored. So write a good writing a good introduction is really important. You want to stay the motivated problem. Why are they important? Why should I keep reading this paper instead of just put it aside and read some other papers? You want to narrow down the scope of the problem. Be more specific. It's time to now be more specific within the intro compared to the abstract. Why should I care about these specific problems? Briefly go over what previous works have done and then state your goal that here is our goal. Or, I mean, it's, it's, you can do something as easy as our goal is to blah, 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 right? You can follow this format for sure. I do this a lot because sometimes it's, like, it's, it's obvious, it's easy. I just state the goal. Um, or you can break things down a little bit more, uh, then state your observation that lead to your design. But this is can change a little bit, right? Depending on how the mechanics of your design actually work. Uh, in engineering paper, these are basically things you can probably follow. Like here, here's the goal. These are what, what you observe. So we can utilize this trick to actually build a better design. And then you explain how your design works and briefly explain how this solved the problem. Then you kind of summarize the results. And in, in some area, uh, uh, you can do this as well, including the area I'm working in. I, I can actually say, in, in, in conclusion, our here's our uh, contribution and have bullet points, right? One thing I want to stress again is human process information serially not in parallel right let's say you're sitting and trying to work and there are three different things going on at the same time you're going to lose the ability to kind of comprehend all the three things together so when you read a paper it's much easier to process information one issue at a time don't divert one issues into multiple like one issue into multiple issues sorry about that grammar mistake uh when you write a paper it should not happen um sorry about that uh so let me actually get rid of this don't divert one issue into multiple issues this is confusing for your readers right and don't interleave multiple things together not switch in one thing and then switch back to another thing and switch back to the first thing if you really, really need to, you state it clearly, right? Try to make one paragraph flowing to the next paragraph. Everything would expand on the earlier paragraph. That's how you can build a chain of new, new, hopefully new contribution and knowledge for the reader, right? So the good introduction would goes a long way because uh, uh, the reader would be more excited about learning what you're trying to do. And also, a really well-written introduction can relate the reader's pain to the problem you're aiming to solve, right? Because I mean, when you're an engineer, right, you, you, you're working on your field, right, all the time, you will run into a certain problem that always annoy you. And let's say you, the paper you're reading solved that problem. You're like, oh, okay, this is cool. Like, I'm going to try to read this and see how this can be solved, right? Uh, and a well introduction will give a preview of the paper. It's like when you look at movie preview, right? A good one would give you a really good graph of whether I should read through, keep reading or not, right? Uh, but the difference between movie preview and introduction in, in scientific writing is you can actually spoil 
to read it quite a lot, right? Just tell them what's going on. Just tell them what's going on so they can keep reading. And then you move on to write the background. What are the distance of background knowledge you need to tell your audience? State any assumptions you're making. How does relevant work deal with the problem you're aiming to solve? And explain why they might not really deliver what you want. And you would limit the number of work to be the, the really relevant ones. The rest will go to related work. You can kind of do it early in the paper. Uh, these days, when I start to read paper, most of the time I'll see that move back to the, the, the later section of the paper, like the, uh, the right before conclusion. Both works. Uh, my preference is put the related work at the back, put background in the front, so you know the really relevant ones, and you know more when you check out the related work section at the end. A really background should allow reader to catch the, uh, the, 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 the state of the art, quote unquote, right? The, the best design that I can get nowadays, including the one that are published in the paper, right? And then you want to motivate your work. You can connect this as a part of the background. Uh, you can also use this section as a separate like, analysis uh, to, to back up your problem, show why the problem is hard to solve, so why the why the problem is so so important to to perform, right? Or, or things, whatever things you want to measure. You also should use this section to provide any observation or key insights that drive your design. It would kind of refocus your reader attention to your work, and you also should state your goal, right? To go state it again and be fundamental. Everything you say should be backed by science. I should be able to build from my building block in science. I should be able to construct whatever you're trying to do through logical reasoning, right? Why does the previous solution fail to solve the problem? And we would go into the important details, but, but check, make sure you do the relevant ones and cite previous work as needed. Especially in the case, let's say your result go against multiple previous works, you need to prove in a really, really clear way. Don't just throw in the data of statistics. Actually use signs to back things up, right? To back things up, especially when your data actually kind of go against a previous published paper, right? That's how you can make the review believe in you, right? Don't just say, hey, believe me. You need to back it up with data, science, and reasoning, logical reason from basic science. And you want to explain your design. These can be done in the top-down or bottom-up way. Top-down is when you have start with the high-level design and you explain each component. Bottom-up is you explain each component and then you explain how all the components are uh, put together. Your job, your primary job, is to tell readers why your design works. So I'll go through some of the examples here. So let's start with the top-down approach. Work well when the components are related. So you have uh, one or two single goals, like one one single goal or a couple of goals you want to deliver. You first give the overall design that you might want to pair this with a clear figure, for example, and you would explain how the whole design will achieve your goal. And then you're gonna explain how each of the components work, right? So let's just uh, explain how uh, what are the components, but why. Why do you need each of this? What does this solve? Make sure you provide enough detail. But you can also use an example to describe the design. A bottom line approach, uh, in my opinion, it kind of work well when you have multiple components designed to resolve certain problems. And when you put everything together, it build, they build the case for the bigger design. Uh, you first explain how each component works and how they basically modify and fix certain problems. And explain how you put everything together so you can use an example to help again to help the describe the design. And you want to break down the complex part by clearly level. And we have figures or a complex text, right? You want to clearly level the figure. So I'm going to show, show you a figure from a paper I published uh, uh, before, right? Uh, and here's a figure, right? You can see that. There are figure explanation, like figure four, example bottlenecks created by TLB Miss. So if you work in computer architecture, you kind of notice what these are. But let's assume 
right now that you don't know that. So I'm just go through the figure, and then we figure 4A and 4B level to the left. The top, I say no virtual address translation. Then so if you work in computer science, you can, and if you read the text, if you read the text, you, you basically clearly say, hey, that's our ideal baseline in terms of performance. You want to, basically in the paper, I want to enabling address translation with the performance of figure 4A. I want to shrink the time. So I will say, hey, I'll set the baseline for the readers in the text, right? And then we say, hey, this is the baseline that my proposal is trying to uh, uh, address. And then with this, right, with the ideal and the baseline, baseline of the, 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 the hardware I can buy nowadays, I can now see the benefit of getting close to the, the ideal case. Then I use different color here, right, on the figure. So I would have the text explaining what are these colors. I would explain all the color coding. I can use this label to do one, two, three, four in the text. So in the text, I can say, now what A would do, blah. And then in, in parentheses, circle one. Then I can refer to the figure. This allows me to have level that I can refer to in the text, right? Another example from uh, the, the paper I published as well, right? Over here is for the mechanics. Over before that, it was more like a baseline versus ideal, right? Now it's our component. You can see there's multiple things going on, right? So I go left to right, that's how human process information. Go left to right, again, go left to right, I'll have this level one, two, and three. I can use it back in the text again, right? You see that I'll put in the first component. I'll put in the arrow sign to show the movement and the flow of every single item, left to right. And then I'll put in the clear condition, for example, if this happened, go here. If this happened, goes here, right? And then I, again, color code the figure. So make sure it's as clear as possible, not just make it look nice, but make sure it's clear. So you should do both of them, right? Even things like fonts and the font size, right? Make sure they're consistent. The heading should have one font size. If you use italic, you keep that for certain thing over here. It's like the, the component name is italicized. The component, the, the name in the paper that we use, we use just bold font. The, the, the actual hardware component is italicized up. Everything follows the font size from big to small, right? So now that we describe the design, the next step is to talk about methodology. Right? This is basically where you would uh, explain how did you test your design. So the reader should be able to read this section and know exactly how to conduct the experiment. So your evaluation methodology would, would allow the reader to replicate it. And you should be able to allow the reader to list all the controlled variables. Put it there. Right? And explain the infrastructure. You run it on this machine, you set it up in this way. Uh, these are the, all the components I use, all the configurations. Explain how do you plan to evaluate the design? What are the key metrics? How are you going to measure something like performance, energy consumption, or, or how good is your design? You also want to make sure it's fair. So you would provide the apple to apple comparison. Apple to apple basically means that you compare the, the thing that you can actually qu quantitatively compare, right? And with that, you move on the result section. These are gonna be different based on the areas you're working on. Some prefer multiple sections to be a result that present the, the data as is. And then the separate discussion and put in your opinions on how the data you presented and what was my, what's the other opinions. So these are more of the science-based paper. Uh, loved, uh, they, they, they do this a lot and it's just perfect for them because you want to first clearly present the data and then anything that, that are from your thought that comes afterward in the discussion. In our area, especially in computer science, you would merge the two things into one. You provide the result, you explain what happened, and then you talk about, okay, because 
we see this effect, and here's our uh, observation of what actually happened, and you provide additional results to back it up, right? And you want to prioritize your data, so the main plot should focus on the most important thing. Show your design work and achieve the goal. And if you have any additional uh, plots that would address any secondary goals, so it's still on the goal side, right? How to address all the goals that I'm setting out to. And then you add more data to prove your design. It can be to prove that it's correct, it's robust, it's not costly, or to show the behavior that, that you're trying to improve. Right? You want to sort everything based on the importance. And when you want to present the data, make sure you explain what you're showing, what are on the X axis, what are on the Y axis, what should the reader focus on, minimize the reader efforts, right? When you want to pre present multiple plots, be consistent. Things that go onto the X axis should be in the same order, should be in the same color. This is done to minimize the reader effort. And here's one of my example from the paper, right? So on the y-axis, I show the result. It's called weighted speed up. It's a metric that we can measure the performance of a hardware uh, hardware processor, right? Uh, basically, computer do by right? how fast that is. Uh, I have the figure name, figure eleven, with the explanation. The x-axis, I would. These are level and, and, and actually explained in the methodology. So it's clear what's zero HMR, what's one HMR. Average is self explanatory, is average. You can see that I level all the axis. I have level all the captions from the baseline, static baseline. So on the methodology, I have that explanation, including the ideal, right? In, in this case, our mechanism is called mass and there are multiple components. So I will use mass dash certain components. Um, and then you can see that we use a really clear, distinct color pattern. Because there are quite a lot of bars here, eight in total. So you can't just stick with like four colors or four color scheme, right? So we use pattern with colors to make sure it's more clear. Uh, one of the extra thing we did is actually try to print this in black and white because most people when they write, uh, when they read papers, a lot of time I would print in black and white. I want to make sure those are also distinct so I can tell if I print in black and white, I can see that what are these bar, right? I would highlight the main finding, like the speed up of 58.7% uh, for this particular uh, set of bar. I would also group the data to see the each group plus the average. So this is minimize the reader effort, right? To explain, I mean, to, to actually understand your plots. And you want to discuss your data, just don't just report the number. Reader can look, right? So numbers are important, but you from that, you want to explain what the plot is for. You want to explain why certain data behave in certain way. Does everything behave according to your design? What are the outliers? What costs the, the performance benefit? And what costs the outliers, right? Uh, this is where you should pay attention to detail because you never know. Sometimes it actually spawn and your next paper idea actually that are hidden in your data. And now that we talk about uh, evaluation, the next thing is related work. This is going to follow directly from your literature survey uh, lecture, right? So be complete and thorough. You must cover all the relevant and high impact works on your field, right? Ideally, all the relevant works that you think should be included. You want to break the discussion down to multiple subtopics. Don't list one paper at a time. Logically group them uh, so that each subtopic should be related to certain elements of your problem or your design. And now that related work's done, you say, hey, I, I summarize your work in a conclusion. Don't copy the abstract. The abstract gives you a high level of your overview of the paper. It's basically motivated whether you want to read the rest of the paper. Conclusion tells the reader the key takeaway. Now that you read the paper, these are the things I want you to get out after you read the paper. Focus on the problem and how your design address the problem and focus on the key takeaways. 
All right. So that's basically it for the, the, the paper construction. What are my other useful tips, right? Again, simplicity is king. Do not make English complex. Focus on making science easy to grasp, right? And clarify your contribution. A good figure is really important. You would explain your overall design, explain where the benefits come from, explain how things are proceeding. When I said figure, it doesn't mean plot. It's both plot of your data as well as the drawing that you want to convey to readers. Another advice is collect good papers. Save when, whenever you go through a paper, you love the paper's writing. Save that so that you have a good place to start with on the paper template, the flow, the outline. Save paper that have good figures to that explain their design so that you can follow multiple examples depending on the situation. You save paper that you read and feel the writing is so clear. So you can actually look at why so you, and you so that you can imitate that that ability to clearly explain your idea. These are gonna be good examples that you should also strive for. Right. Also, why I want you to review high impact paper from top tier venues. Because I can tell you from my own experience, when you publish at these top venues, you're gonna the people that publish there are gonna spend meticulous care about the paper's English. It's kind of in their heart to, to work as hard as possible including the writing so it's, it's more than the writing i'm going to be in a much better quality right so the paper title uh of course also can be used to attract readers uh, both positively or negatively so don't mislead your reader for what's it's not uh, if you need two lines you want to put line break at proper places and uh, don't break the title in the middle of the long phrase or, or uh, break the title when you basically make sure you break the title when you're moving from one thing to another if you need two lines. Uh, make sure the title will cover what your work is about. When you want to use acronym, you can use it as fine, right? For example, I use it before I call something SMS, which stands for stage memory scheduling. I can also give an actual name. For example, I have a technique that combines multiple things into a bigger thing, and I call this mosaic, right? Basically, it's like uh, it sort of you can convey it. it's something similar to the mosaic piece of art where it, it would combine multiple pictures, a uh, small picture, into a bigger picture, right? Using acronym can buy you space as well, but don't overuse it because readers have limited memory. Don't force them to remember 10 different acronyms or 10 different names. Right, and don't just pick random letters in a word just to make a cool acronym. Make sure it makes sense. So don't try too hard about that. I've seen some example that try too hard, and it kind of backfire. Look for the back, right? And be consistent. Do not use variation of the same word. Stick with what you have defined. Stick with what you have defined. If X means certain things, Y means certain things, pick one. If they X and Y mean the same thing, pick one and use it throughout the paper. Plots should be aligned and should have the same size. When listing multiple items, each bullet point should follow the same structure. Uh, you also want to make sure you check for grammar mistakes. Uh, each country, to be honest, has their own common mistakes, so you want to be aware of them. For example, Thai people, we are really horrible at using articles subject verb agreement because in our language there's no articles no subject verb agreements there's no past or present or future tense so we make a lot of those mistakes so as well be aware of the common ones right these are some of the things that for sure thai people are really horrible at don't ever don't ever use google translate to write a paper if you do that this is bad we like, just don't do it guys make really don't ever do this. Uh, tools for editing. Uh, many of you have used Microsoft Word before. I do encourage you to try LaTeX if possible. In this class, I'm going to enforce everyone to use LaTeX for their project report. It's a part of the learning. Uh, I personally I think it's much more powerful tools to make your paper look really nice. It's 
make it a lot easier to move, move plots and figures around. Uh, and these say you can use the online version of that. You don't have to even set it up on your machine. You can go to overleaf.com. It's actually free and, and allow collaboration. Multiple pe pe people can modify. It's like Google Doc, but for LaTeX. You also, uh, sometimes you can run into a case of page limit. And you might not be left just like, oh, 12 page paper, double column. There's no way I'm going to use 12 pages. Surprise, you are going to use that. <laughs> so at some point when you're writing your draft, you hit the page limit. So be concise. Uh, you can use like we space and latex to kind of adjust the, the spacing. Because sometimes latex is not perfect. Sometimes it gives too much white space between different figures. So use that to, to, to make sure it looks nice, right? And don't adjust margins, don't adjust spacing between letters. This always looks bad. And I did it before and I do regret that. <laughs> it actually makes a paper really packed, right? So so make sure the paper looks easy to read. That's the key message. And that's it for uh, today's uh, video. Uh, in the next video, we'll talk about elevator pitch and we kind of wrap it up with also resume building. Uh, for those of you who are taking the seminar course, uh, I did promise to have this resume building uh, up earlier. So you might have seen the video in the link I sent you anyway uh, through email. Um, so hopefully you're looking forward to that. And thank you so much for uh, uh, sticking with this uh, lecture. I hope you find this interesting. Thank you so much.